but still good morning. Morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It really gives me uh, a great pleasure to share with you uh, what I really hope is going to be a few uh, new and fresh thoughts around uh, waste as a, as a resource. And I know the program specifically spoke about e-waste, uh, but we do believe that the principles I'm going to talk about is really, it has to do with really solid waste, all of the waste streams out there. Um, also, uh, I'm really hoping to share a few new ideas and also on how to unlock the value from waste through a new, fresh, meaningful and, 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 and achievable, to do it in an achievable manner. Great. Wow. Okay. Now everybody can hear me. Great. So I'm going to contextualize and I'm going to put it uh, within the context of the continent. Um, and I love this name. I love uh, talking about the sleeping giant. Um, when we look at waste, when we look at treatment of waste, um, key principle is always regional. It's always about volume. It's always about scale. Um, so I just want to give a little bit of context in terms of the sleeping giant and really the consumption, the growth of consumption, specifically to, to Africa. And I think, you know, Africa we know is the largest continent, it's larger than the US, China, Russia, and India, and the EU combined. Um, covers 6% of the Earth's surface and 20% of a total land mass. Um, largest country is Algeria, and then uh, roughly a quarter of the size of of the US or China, and about 70% of the size of, of India. And I think as we know, uh, Lagos is the largest city in Africa. It's currently the seventh largest city in the world, and it's projected by 2100, expected to be number one. So in terms of uh, population, most populous uh, country, 2050, uh, it's estimated that Nigeria's population will be equal to the U.S. So phenomenal growth in terms of uh, population. I think what's very important, and I think uh, Minister Davies um, and some other, some other speakers also touched on it, um, that the Africa is the largest population of people from 15 to 25 years of age. And I think in terms of megatrends, we've all heard about the new way of doing business. That's re being, really being pushed forward by the millennials. Really a new way of thinking, prioritization different in terms of fostering an environment for generations to come. And I think it's an important factor that we need to keep in mind. And I think very important, uh, Africa is expected by 2040 to have the largest workforce population in the world, exceeding China and India combined. So, noteworthy. So we say uh, Africa is sleeping, and uh, we all know that everybody grows some or other time. If we look at all of the global economies over the last 150 years, we see that, that all of these economies has grow at some or other point. If we look at Africa, it's really it's delayed at this point in time. <coughs> and Africa is just really catching up. Economists really project that Africa's GDP growth is, is about 30 years behind China at this point in time, and about 20 years behind uh, India. But I think noteworthy is also that African leadership is not standing still. And uh, we see the diversification of, of industry. We've seen that uh, countries like uh, Nigeria has been bleeding because they've only been focusing on, on oil and gas. And that, that is definitely <coughs> changing. There's a saying out there that uh, the African tigers are growing faster than the Asian dragons. I think if there's any continent that can do what China has done over the last 30 years, then it's definitely Africa in the next 30 years that has the potential. So 
So coming back to the workforce again, um, it's estimated uh, that the African workforce will swell by 163 million just in this decade. And by 2035, once again, bigger than China. By 2050, Africa will account for 25% of the world's workers. If we look at uh, government spending, this is, a, this is a really important indicator. 20% of government spending is currently going to education. I think we've heard a lot from, from uh, uh, the speakers and from uh, Dr. Seeswe on, on specifically education. And yes, maybe South Africa lacking behind at this uh, point in time. We also see that the purchasing power is rising. All of these demographic shifts are really contributing to the rise of the middle class in, uh, in Africa. And then also we currently see this uneven uh, foreign direct investment picture throughout uh, Africa that's really driven by global uh, uncertainty. So the global political, economic and investment landscape has really entered into an exceptional period of, of transition. And I think uh, we've, we've seen that Africa feels it when the rest of the world sneezes. Um, we've even seen it through the UK vote to leave the European Union. Um, we've even seen it through the election of Donald Trump in terms of focus, UN agencies, funding. Um, I think we've heard about the fourth industrial revolution and we've seen the end of the commodity super cycle at, at the same time. And I think that's also really impacted um, Africa. Uh, but we see the technologies, we see the Internet of Things taking shape. Um, we see Africa really leaping on in terms of um, access to, to mobile data, to mobile phones. Penetration rates are really high. Not that high on, um, on smartphones, though. Penetration in terms of mobile connectivity, yes, very high. But Africa is still lacking behind in terms of access to Internet data. So uh, a good few indicators in terms of uh, the growth and moving forward. I'm going to now just quickly show you two small, very short videos. And it's just um, specifically looking at uh, now the sleeping giant's consumption needs. Um, and it's just looking at from a, I think we, uh, I heard Minister Davies talking about circular economy. I think it's on everybody's lips. It's in terms of the potential, in terms of uh, I'm going to quickly touch on how Africa can actually leapfrog specific issues that uh, that the developed world has had in this regard. Um, and then a second one in terms of uh, recovery of, of materials. And then I'm going to put a question out. I'm not going to expect you to, to write a small test, but I'm going to put a question out. I'm going to move to a next slide. I'm going to contextualize in terms of building blocks to really unlock this value from the waste stream. Um, and then I'll check in back with you. The conventional lifespan of most products is linear. There's a clear beginning and a clear end. Once they've served their purpose, they're often discarded, forgotten, and left behind. But HP takes a different approach, one that focuses on reuse, reinvention, and reintroduction. Not life spans, life cycles. From the very beginning, our products and services are designed and built to impact lives in unique ways. Once they've served their purpose, they can start a new cycle. Instead of ending up in landfills, they can be put back into the hands of the very people they were designed to inspire. It's the type of global change we've been committed to leading for over 50 years. From customers and employees to partners and people across the globe, we continue to be driven by one simple idea, a better world for all of us. Whether it's proven methods or new innovations, every product has a purpose, every service has meaning, and every decision matters. Not just to us, but to everyone, everywhere. Because we believe we're responsible for everything we put into this world, ensuring it all comes full circle. Great. And, and really the quick take on this one is it's th this is the disruptive 
business model that we're talking about. And as HP, we're aligning. We're aligning to that uh, business model in terms of a low carbon and a, and a, and a circular economy. And it's, it's ultimately to shift from that linear approach, from the take, make, use, and dispose cycle. But it's deeply rooted through our generations. And it's going to take quite a bit. So I'm going to just also just emphasize a few points around that mind shift that we, that we ultimately need to do. And then uh, here's the resource one. And I'm going to have a quick question after this one. <laughs> Great, so a wonderful story about uh, Rosetta. Uh, we, we released that story just about a, two months ago. Um, and my question to you is, why would you, why would you say that this uh, project is a business imperative for HP. But just think about it a little bit, and I'm going to go through the next slide, and then we're going to come back to, to the answer. Why would this specific project be a business imperative for, for HP? Whoops. Oh, I see it's an Acer, not an not a HP. <laughs> I think it's maybe just the graphics card. But it's basically, it's a circular economy uh, illustration. It's from an Accenture report. I picked it up recently in World Economic Forum PACE platform for accelerated circular economies uh, session. And I thought it was really noteworthy in terms of circular economy potential when we look at ultimately the life cycle of, of industry. And I think, uh, you know, really for me, it's about, uh, let me use, about looping the end of life cycle and looping it straight into the manufacturing cycle in terms of secondary raw materials. And I think we can have a look at the potential value in terms of about $3 trillion that is currently being wasted. Um, I think also noteworthy um, is to see that the initial cycles in terms of transport, it's really visible elements to us as the consumer and the use of the product. I think we've seen it's come a long way but so much less in terms of potential when we lose sight of the product, the everyday product. And I do not want to just talk about computers. I'm talking about each and every product out there that we use each and every day. So turn waste into, into a resource. Um, we've heard it all. We've heard waste too well. We've heard about the urban mine. Um, Sounds familiar? I'm sure, I'm sure you've, you've heard the terminology. Um, and frankly speaking, um, you know, we've been discussing these topics for at least the last decade, at least, at least as responsible industry, as, as HP Inc. At conferences, workshops, we've been doing studies. Um, and, well, and all that I can say is that I think the biggest winners out of this topic, this debate, has really been the conference organizers. I think they've really made a killing out of this. And there's not really that tangible results that we can see in terms of harvesting the value from the waste, building industry, creating sustainable jobs, and adding value to, to, to the local economies. I think we, at this point in time, we've learned so many lessons. We've had so many headaches as industry, especially in Africa. And I'm now contextualizing Africa and the work that we've done in Africa, including South Africa that we're really proposing a mind shift when it comes to the concept of waste. I think we're really asking that uh, waste needs to be turned on its head. The concept of waste needs to be turned on its head. And I think with this, we're not saying that we need to do away with the word waste, but rather reserve the use of the word for materials that are toxic. Materials that cannot be recovered and made safe for reuse. Why not rather keep waste, that specific concept, for those specific materials? And then we set the goal for ourselves to ultimately eliminate medium to long term that specific waste stream. 
let's eliminate toxic, let's eliminate materials that cannot be kept in circulation at its highest value. That is, that is really the mind shift. Um, and please call out, I mean, if, if I do not explain it properly or I need to give an example, so it doesn't make sense. Give me an example. What do you mean? So, and I think it, it's really moving forward with this waste stream. Um, and, and, and even internally in HP, I was last week in Europe. Internally in HP, I'm being wrapped over the knuckles because I talk of waste. Ruben, why are you talking of waste? And, it, and it's once again in terms of, in terms of that definition. Um, and I had, a, I had a discussion with my colleague. And I said, you know, frankly speaking, you know, we call a spade a spade in, you know, in Africa. You know, it, it is what it is. We cannot at this point in time, there is no industry to responsibly take care of our product come end of life. So why? You know, we first need to solve the problem around waste. And, and, and I think I really got an interesting reply. Um, this colleague of mine, uh, she's doing quite a bit of work on, on circular economy, also works closely with the Ella MacArthur Foundation, with Andrew and the guys. And she just said to me, you know, uh, why could you guys, Africa, why could you not leapfrog? As I said previously, why can you not leapfrog all the issues that we had in terms of waste, dealing with the problem of product come end of life? Why not leapfrog in terms of looking at the bigger picture, looking at determining what products you use and how you use it? And then you're going to solve all these issues of sitting with the waste stream or the toxic materials. Why did you choose that product in the first place that you could have had the information on in terms of toxic materials and that this, these materials can't actually be made safe or it can't be, can't be recycled? And I think, as I've said, circulation as long as possible, and we need to start putting our foot down in terms of starting the life cycle, when we buy the product, when we use the product. We have the choice. The end user has the choice. And it's really about looking at tangible solutions on the ground and really starting with the key decision makers of... Uh, of the specific product, it's a life cycle. And, um, and I think less, less, less on policy mechanisms. And, I, and I'm going to touch on policy, less, a little bit less on policy mechanisms, a little bit less on terms of that big stick. Why do we need to punish what has already gone wrong? So it's just to, to, to shift, just to do the mind shift. So let me quickly just share with you a few ideas. Really building blocks. First one is not really a building block, it is the foundation. Education and entrepreneurship. I think we've heard about education this morning. South Africa lacking behind. And it's really about education, and then it needs to be turned into competency. But then ultimately, in terms of sustainable business, small business, sustainable jobs, we need to enable entrepreneurship. We have so many people such good ideas but they haven't got the tools they haven't got the tools to put it into action and to really turn it into an enterprise to create uh, sustainable jobs and then in terms of building blocks um, i'm going to name three basically three in parallel um, doug how am i doing Circular economy. Um, let me quickly unpack it the way we understand circular economy. Consumers just discard uh, products that, that, that no longer has uh, any value. Because the products are either broken, out of fashion. You heard that one? You know, I need that, uh, I need that Model 8. You know, or, you know. And then uh, it's, it's been found that in developing economies, up to 80% of things are really stored in a typical home for about five months before actually using it. And it's coming back to that linear approach. It's coming back to take, make, use. And sometimes we use something for a few minutes. We never use it again. 
It goes into, goes into our garage, goes into the cupboard to be forgotten. Um, if we look at the sharing platform that's really taking off, um, really, really interesting. Um, in terms of maybe incorporating it with digital technologies, it, it really it starts new relationship, starts new business opportunities, really for the consumers, companies, micro entrepreneurs who want to rent, share, swap, or lend their idle idle goods. Who can give me an example of that currently really taking off in South Africa and really serving the needs of the commuters out there? Uber. What if manufacturers and retailers bore the total cost of ownership, HP Inc., in terms of the PCs, the tablets, the printers we sell? We bore the total cost of ownership. Typically, what would happen with the HP is our business model would start shifting, or a manufacturer's business model would start shifting, because you suddenly now rent out, or you being paid for a service, just used for that specific product's function. And typically, the business model would, our business model, or the manufacturer's business model, would suddenly start focusing on longevity. Have we heard that from manufacturers? I mean, when we do transactional sales, product obsolescence, Ooh. reliability. Reliability would be very important for us because we sell you a service. Reusability. And we've just seen when consumers lease or pay for product by use through the product as a the HP model is called DAS, so it's device as a service, or product as a service. Um, the business model fundamentally shifts, and it shifts in a good way. We've seen that performance trumps volume. We've seen that durability tops disposability. And companies now have the opportunity to rather focus on the customer and build new relationships. That's a, that's a complete shift in terms of business model. Very disruptive. And I think as the industry was HP, we really hope to transform this circular economy concept, you know, from an abstract concept into an easy to understand model for the consumer in terms of, uh, in terms of the product. But I think uh, at a practical level, I think we've all agreed uh, making that shift is not going to be easy. I think uh, we've seen that most companies on a transactional level selling you goods over the counter, whether it's at the macro or the game, it's, 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 it's very difficult for them to capitalize on this opportunity in terms of circular economy. Why? Because their strategies, their structure, their operations, their supply chains are deeply rooted in the linear approach. That, that's their foundation. And that's part of their DNA. And it's going to be difficult, difficult to change. Disruptive technology, we heard Minister Davies talking about 3D printing. Now you're going to have short-run manufacturing. HP is focusing on commercial 3D printing, short production runs at the source, where it's needed, where the product is being bought, where you buy the water pump. We can print it 3D. For your car, it's all about inventory on demand. No more transport, no more distribution. Large factories. Um, and then really lastly, recovery and recycling. So now we start, now I start seeing where my, my peers are coming from. Or even why are you talking about waste? Why aren't you talking about recovery and recycling? We need to recover these products. We need to recover the materials. We need to reuse it and reclaim, reclaim the value. That's basically what I'm going to say about circular economy. Quickly incentivize. This, this one is very important. Um, and here we look at incentivizing to really change the behavior of the end user, of the consumer. 
and also from a producer point of view. But how do we do it? How do we do it? We can do it through, instead of a big stick, incentivize industry. In terms of product, let's say maybe that has recycling content. We've seen in Europe um, public sector introducing a term called GPP, uh, Green Public Procurement. If HP Inc. wants to sell into government into Europe, all of our printers need to have 15% recycled plastic content. Let's think a little bit about that question I asked. Recycled content needs to be quality material, needs to be clean. I'm not meaning cleans as in dirty, it needs to be unpolluted. It needs to be free of BFRs, brominated flame retardants cannot be contaminated so we need the drivers really there and I think in terms of what Europe and the public sector is doing is already cleaning up the environment even the ocean feels the impact the landfills are feeling the impact so very important in terms of that mind shift um, and my colleagues are asking me more Ruben go out into Africa and go and find us some good clean plastic so at this point in time, we're cleaning up the plastics in Africa and we're shipping it out. We're shipping it out currently to Canada to be put back into our product. It's in demand. Is that waste? I don't think so. And I just want to quickly make a comment in terms of, and I'm going to get to the, to the dark horse now. How many? Yes. Okay. Quickly, the dark horse... Um, in terms of uh, extended producer responsibility. And I think everybody expected me to talk about extended producer responsibility. Expensive, extended producer responsibility is dead in the ditch for Africa. I'm saying if DP, Department of, uh, DPSA, Department of Struggling Our Services and Administration, if they pass a policy in terms of green procurement, in terms of recycling content, products that we import into this country, the immediate impact on the environment, cleaning up the environment, would be three, four-fold in terms of EPR, in terms of what we've achieved in EPR over the past 10 years. Just that, just that, that slight change. Okay, and then quickly, there's, there's my dark horse. And this is, this is, and I didn't really cover industry collaboration now, so I mean, I'm, I'm out of time, I'm gonna skip that one. That one is more about inclusive uh, platforms. World Economic Forum is picking up on this, Pace Platforms is picking up on this, and we've seen where industry come together, and let's say you typically get a UN organization in, that suddenly their funding application process, we're running now a project in Nigeria, we've got the UN on board, we've got Jeff on board, there's money available, millions available, it usually takes 18 months to unlock that money, but we see through these big industry collaborations, big inclusive platforms, that suddenly the Jeff application for funding is, is narrowed down to about six months. It's, it's amazing to see what industry collaboration with some muscle on an inclusive platform can do. And just quickly um, on um, extended producer responsibility, we, we feel as industry that it's really failed, the very industry that it was supposed to support. Um, we, just, we just believe, and I think you know, through the panel we can, we can maybe touch on it as well. Um, Ten years ago we felt it was really the key, the key to create that level playing platform, the key to create the industry, um, fair standards, but it, it, it's really failed us. Um, and we, we've just experienced that policymakers in Africa has been telling industry, has been giving industry a restrictive legislative framework where we could not put our lessons learned, our expertise to good use in terms of unlocking uh, that value. That we've seen in South Africa, that we've seen in Kenya, Kenya, the regulation has been coming for three, four years. It's, it's been ready. It's, it's been at Parliament for three, four years. We've seen what has happened in Ghana. The environmental minister currently being arrested. It's, so, yeah, not, not very good. But, yes, extended producer responsibility, definitely needed. Um, it's going to take time. Let's rather focus on the building blocks, on a foundation to really unlock. And then just quickly coming back to the answer to my question. Why is that Haiti... The Rosetta project, why is it imperative for, for HP in terms of business, in terms of running our business? And I'm typically wondering if I'm going to hear, it's a good social driver for you guys. 
wow, you guys can shine. Hmm? It's not. It's materials. We need it. And that comes back to the recovery and the expectation, global expectation in terms of recycling content. PET bottles is high quality. We use it for the manufacturing of new ink cartridges and new printers. And we're being pushed by public procurement. We're being pushed by large customers. We participate in tenders in Europe where sustainability or recycling content is 40% of the awarding criteria. 40. Price is 10, 15. Because the countries, the organizations understand in terms of the impact, the broader industry impact, in terms of shifting, in terms of doing the mind shift. Thank you. Thank you.